start in prayer and I'm, I want to teach a little bit and then I want to share from my heart and then we're going to break up into groups and we're going to pray for each other and then we'll finish with worship okay but one of the things that I think is definitely going to be happening to the church in 2018 is that the fear of the Lord is going to fall and so we've got to be repented we've got to be squeaky clean not by our own works can't do it in our own strength but you know just by listening to the Holy Spirit and just repenting repenting does not mean God I'm sorry repenting means actually turning around and walking and living in the opposite direction it's got nothing to do with the words that you say really it's got to do with the attitude of the heart and the actions that we take so uh, in order for us to walk in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit which is what the church did in the book of Acts in chapter 13 and when they did that when they walked in the fear of the Lord and when they walked in the comfort of the Holy Ghost um, church had peace and multiplied um, but you know what we need to understand what the fear of the Lord is and that's not coming from a legalistic point of view but just recognizing that yes he is my father my Abba my daddy my God but he is also the creator of heaven and earth he is God majestic judge and so it's walking in in the fullness of a relationship does that make sense so you can smile at me Charles come and sit up the front <coughs> So, Father, we just, we just want to thank you today. Yeah. Father, we just truly want to thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, for, for just who you are, that you are so amazing in your love for people, that you actually rend the heavens and send your Son, that you would um, take the full punishment of our sins, of our guilt, of our iniquities, of our shame, of our, our chastisement, of our peace, that every sickness and disease, all, all causes of poverty, you took it all at the cross on your son so that we could be set free. And then you said we would establish us in a covenant with you through Jesus Christ. And we just want to give you glory and praise. We just want to honor you. And Father God, we come before you and we recognize that we're moving into a different um, Oh, a different emphasis in the kingdom of God and we want to align with that father we want to align with the third day with the rest of God and with the peace of God but with the resurrection power and we thank you Lord that we are living sacrifices that we present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice that we place everything that's dear to us on the altar and we just release it to you father God for you to do with as you will and we thank you father God that whenever you ask us to give something you are setting us up to receive something so we just want to give you praise and glory because we can trust your heart and we can just walk in the fullness of who you are in Jesus name amen, amen. so we're looking at the third day again and maybe next week it'll just be me here and Danny but anyway <laughs> <laughs> two or three are gathered in his name there we go but this is another third day. This is in John chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 to 11. But then I want to talk a little bit about John before we actually go into this. So in John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. I wonder how prophetic that is. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom mm. and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But you've kept the good wine until now. 
And this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So again, we're looking at the third day, resurrection power, transformation. Do you know there are seven ex um, exclusive miracles just in John alone? They're not in any of the other gospels. They're just in John. And each one of them is about transformation power. There was the man by the pool of Bethesda. There was the nobleman's son who was away at another distance. Um, there was the water turning into wine. Um, there was Jesus walking across the water when the, the, the storm, uh, the, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the night. There was seven of them, seven specific miracles that are listed in John that are not listed in any other gospel. And they are all uh, to do with transformation, resurrection power. They're all to do with who Jesus is and what he came to carry out. And so when you, when you come to read the, the Gospel of John, recognize that there is a big division between Matthew, Mark and Luke and John. It's a big division because Matthew, Mark and, and Luke look at the outer aspects of who Jesus is, but John looks at the inner aspect. So it's, it's a whole different thing. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the differences between Matthew, Mark and Luke and looking at how Jesus is revealed in John chapter 1 because when you get a revelation of how Jesus is revealed in John chapter 1, then you will understand how awesome it is when he walks in the power and you see the transformation in John chapter 2. Just opens your eyes. Man, I can't get past John chapter 1 without falling on my face and coming into adoration because he's just so awesome and it's just laid out there for all of us to see. But quite often when we read the word, we read the word and it's not a hard interaction and it's got to be a hard interaction. It's got to be like you're actually walking with him, that you're treading the road with him as one of his disciples or you're at the wedding and you see the pain of the bridegroom thinking oh my gosh what's going to happen we've run out of wine and you're there and you're imagining with a sanctified imagination you think what's going on and how's it going to happen you've got to be a part of this because the thing is you're in Jesus Christ you are in him and so what he walked through you can walk through in him in the realm of the spirit because in the spirit there's no time is there it's just now, now. And so, you know, we've got to actually engage with the word of God, engage with the gospel. And so I love the, the different, I love Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. I mean, I, I love every book of the Bible, but I love these. Matthew was written to the Jews and it, it reveals Jesus as the Messiah, as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The four faces of the four gospels as talked about in Ezekiel and in Revelation. But in Matthew is the lion of the tribe of Judah and it was written to the Jews. And it's for those who are of a religious viewpoint so if you get somebody saved and they're religious and they might have been going to church but they haven't gotten born again Matthew is the gospel to get them started in because it's written to the religious it's written to the Jews and it was um and it lists the genealogy through Abraham through Abraham to David or through David back to Abraham so there's a a, a genealogy that is released there and it's it's um the, the main word for the book of the gospel of Matthew is fulfilled and it was fulfilled and it is fulfilled and it was fulfilled and so it was quite an amazing kind of a book and as I said before Matthew Mark Luke and John they talk about the outer aspects of the life of Jesus but John talks about the inner ones um, Matthew Mark and Luke talk about his humanity John talks about his deity or his divinity. Matthew, Mark and Luke talk about the public ministry, ministry the, the public conversations that he had, generally speaking. But John is more concerned about the one-on-one -on -one things that he had going at the time. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is all about his Galilean ministry and John is all about his Judean ministry. It's, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is very factual, but if you want doctrine, it's in the book of John. So it's just awesome. So you've got Matthew, Mark and, and Luke, which is sort of like building this, this crescendo. And then you've got John where everything is released and it just becomes whole. We've got the presentation of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But in, in uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke. But in John, there's the revelation of who he is as the son of God, the most high. You know, there's this whole shift. The interesting thing is that Matthew, most of it, it's miracles and everything else is grouped in lots of 10. 
So, you know, there are are 10 things and then there's 10 effects and there's 10 of this. So it's like groupings. But Mark was written to the Romans. And the face, one of the four faces for Mark is the ox. You know, he's the servant. He's the the one that works really hard. The main word in the book of Mark is immediate. 43 times, I think, in the King James. And immediately. And immediately. And 12 times in in the book of King James, in the book of Mark, the chapters are linked together with the word and, and, and. So there's no let up, there's no stop. It's like and, and, and. You know, there's like constant action. So if you get somebody saved who's a man of action, who's a bit of a driver, and particularly in business or stuff like that, then you get them stuck into the book of Mark because they'll recognize power and action. So it's recognizing that not everybody's going to feel comfortable with John. It takes a while sometimes if you're not in that, that place to, to grab hold of it. So we need to disciple people in, in the kind of person that they are. So if they're a driver, if they're a doer, if they recognize power, if that's important to them, mark, because they get the humility that comes from being a servant. You don't get that by itself. Does that make sense? So Luke is completely different. Luke is written to the Greeks. Luke is written from a wisdom point of view. It's very philosophical. It's a story. Mark has snapshots immediately, immediately, immediately. It's like all these snapshots on Instagram, you know, that flash up. Um, but Luke is, an, is, an, is a story that just unfolds about Jesus. And he talks about who he is. And, and he defines Jesus as the perfect man. For Luke shows him to be the son of man. So Luke's got this amazing kind of like this is Jesus as the man, the son of man. And so we see him, you know, and and so for, for Luke, it's for people who like stories, really not interested in, uh, in action, really not interested in religion as such, but Luke is for the ones that are a little bit philosophical, looking for wisdom and loving a good story, because that's what Luke is all about. Am I making sense? The interesting thing is that Luke, even though it's written to the Greeks, the genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. But in Mark, because he's a servant, there's no genealogy because slaves didn't have any genealogy. And so it's all of these kinds of things that are so fast. I love it. I'm, I get excited about this. I hope you do, but I just love it. It just opens the word of God to me so much when you recognize it. And the, the, the word, the, the, the gospel of John... Is, is a completely different gospel because it's revealing Jesus Christ as the Son of God. There is no genealogy. There is no mention of his, of his being born to Joseph and Mary. There's no mention of his baptism. There's no mention of the temptation in the wilderness. There's no mention of anything that really happened to him as a man. But what is talked about is that he is the Son of God and the face that he represents is the face of the eagle. And so in the book of John, there's no earthly genealogy. Like I said, no birth, no baptism, no temptation in the wilderness. There was no transfiguration and there was no ascension in the gospel of John. But there is. This is who the Son of God is. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word is God. And, and in Him is life. And so we've got this beautiful expression of of who Jesus truly is and do you know who the book of John was written to the church it was written to the church over I forget how many 120 something times either the word father or God is used 120 something times it was written to the church the passion of God was revealed in this John 3 16 God so loved the world in fact the word you can see my Bible college teaching days coming out here can't you sorry but the word the world the word world is is used over 80 times in the book of John God is trying to get to us hey listen I want you to disciple the nations I so love the world that I've sent my son So he's saying, I'm your father, I'm your God. Jesus is my son and I want you to take hold with him of the, uh, of the, the, the mission that I entrusted to him, which was saving the world. And so when we come to the book of John, it's a completely different thing. In fact, the other word that is used just after the word father or God, just I think it's 101 times is the word believe, believes, 
believe, believing. And the whole thing about the book of John is that you would believe. A response to the Son of God. We are just so blessed. I mean, I don't have to hide my Bible. I don't have a couple of pages of the Bible to, to, to read. I have Bibles, Bibles at home. I've got study Bibles. I've got, you know, paraphrase. I've got, well, I've got Bibles. But unless when you open it, you get a revelation of Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. You're reading a dry book and it's not a dry book. Men and women died to ensure that we got this book in our hands. People were burned at the stake. People were killed as they continued to try to get the Bible published and into the hands of everyone. We have... Um, I don't know what you'd call it. We have a, a response to Jesus when we pick up the word, that we allow the word to shape us. I don't, my Bibles are marked. I have color codes. I have underlines. I draw little tents, camp here a while. I do P for principle. I do W for warning. I mark my Bibles. But it is absolutely pointless to mark your Bible unless your Bible is marking you. It has to change you. It has to change us. We have to renew our mind. We have, in renewing of our mind, there's a renewing of our speech. There's a renewing of our actions. There's a renewing of our life. You know, we were, con we were born again to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And so in order to be conformed into his image, I need to know him. And I don't know him by coming to church. I don't know him by listening to CDs or watching DVDs or even reading books. I get to know him because I spend time with him in his presence, loving him, letting him love me, allowing the word to wash over me, change me, bring down strongholds, change everything. We are so blessed. It's like it's on tap in Australia. But because it's so freely available, we've got to allow it to, to mark us, to change us, to, to bring things about. You know, as you go through the Gospels, look at the way things are brought in order because the first miracle in, in each Gospel struck at the very heart of the culture and the religion that it was written to. Like in Matthew, it was the leper. Jesus actually touched the leper, which to the Jews was like, oh my gosh, that's so unclean. That's terrible. That's disgusting. And so he struck at the very heart. It's the same in Mark. It's the same in Luke and the same in, in John. The very first miracle work of Jesus in that gospel struck at the very heart of the culture and the religion of the people that it was written to. So as we start to understand this, we can take hold of it. If you get somebody born again who's a bit um, new agey, bit woo-woo-woo, John's the perfect book to get them discipled through. Perfect book for them. Because, you know, they won't get much out of Mark. They won't get a lot out of Matthew. But when you put them with John, because it's written to the, to the spiritual side of a person, they will respond and it will touch something in them. I'm hoping I'm getting you excited. Man, I love the word. I love the word. I love Jesus because he's the word. He's the word. Every time, you know, when we pray the word or we speak the word and it comes out of our spirit, not out of it, but it comes out of our spirit, you realize that you are releasing Jesus Christ into that situation and circumstance. When you say, um, Jesus took my poverty on the cross that I might have his riches and you speak it out and you decree it. You Two things happening. One, you, you build it. Well, th several things happen. Let's not scale to God down. But when you say stuff like that, several things happen. First of all, faith is built because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The second thing is it's the sword of the spirit. So as you release that out of your mouth, it is a weapon against the enemy to bring down what the, what the enemy is doing against you. And third, you are renewing your mind. 
you're renewing your mind. You know, you build yourself up in the Word of God in different areas. Um, you know, in, in your relationship with God, with people, socially, financially, health-wise, in your, in your business. Find scriptures that relate to those areas and, and, and build them up, meditate upon them, make them a part of you because the Word has got to become part of you. Just like it was became part of the Word became flesh, Jesus, the Word has got to become part of who you are. And so it's, it's, all about, it's all about that. But just turn to John chapter 1 because before we can even get to the wedding in the can, in Cana of Galilee, we have to recognize who Jesus Christ is. And John chapter 1 doesn't withhold anything. It just hits us straight between the eyes with revelation. And in verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. And so the very first thing is we have the Word. And, and, and in Him was life. And all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made and in him was life and the life was the light of man. So we've got the word of God. If you go down into verse 3 and verse 4, we've got life and light. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot comprehend it. The darkness cannot lay hold of it. The darkness can't perceive it. So the word of God is life to you and the word of God is light to you. Remember Psalm 119 where it says that the word of God is a lamp to my feet for present day choices but it's a light to my path for future decisions and that's the power that's in the word of God and oh just glory to God it's in the word it's not in us as you know it's in the power it's in the word of God and so um, in verse 14 and 18 it says that he the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word is Jesus, is the expression of God's heart, the expression of God. Life and light is what the word is to us. The word gives us life and the word gives us light, revelation. And it's the son, it's our personal savior. And he, Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth full of grace and truth and we have received of his fullness you know this is the truth of who you are you have received of his fullness and he has given you the power to become sons of God quite often we just need to receive the power so that he can cause us to become what he wants us to be it's not a question of striving and stressing and straining and it's not a question of that it's just like Jesus I surrender you know that that living sacrifice God I give it all to you just make me what you want me to be cause me to hear your voice Lord whatever it is that you want me to do I'll do it wherever it is you want me to go I'll go God I just give myself to you I just want to live for your pleasure I, I just and not in my own strength, Lord, because that won't give you any pleasure. Let me do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, out of a joyful heart and a heart of thanksgiving because you're so wonderful. The law was given through Moses, right? Moses gave the law, but, the, but grace and truth came with Jesus. So that's a relationship. You know, Moses extended the law, but it was at a, a distance. But grace and truth came with him. So that's a relationship that he's talking about right there. But then in, down in verse 29, it says that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is our Jesus. This is who died on the cross for us. This is who took our punishment and carried our shame and our guilt and our sorrow and everything else. This is our Jesus, the Word of God, the light, the life, the Son of God. You know, he, is, he came with grace and truth. Um, he is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Down in verse um, 41 he's the Messiah we have found the Messiah we've found the Christ we've found the anointed one we've found the one we've been waiting for you can hear the heart of oh, didn't you feel that when you got saved when I actually gave my heart to Jesus Christ it was like oh God come home I found what I've been looking for my whole life. I found the peace. I've found I've never been able to describe what I was looking for. But when I came to Jesus, oh, 
He was just something that fulfilled everything I was looking for. And then religion gets in and mucks stuff up. But, you know, we've got to chuck religion out and come back to the purity of a relationship. In um, verse 49, it says that you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel, the king of the kingdom. And then in verse 51, most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you'll see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. Jacob's ladder. How awesome is our God? So when he asks us to sacrifice something on the altar, when he asks us to give something up, when you look at who he is and what he's given for us, and when you recognize that the heart of God is to always give us something more than we've surrendered. I surrendered my life, but oh my gosh, he gave me his life. I surrendered my way of thinking and then he gave me the mind of Christ. I surrendered my poverty and he gave me his riches. I surrendered my striving and stressing and straining and he gave me his blessing. You know, we're we're so blessed and we just need to stop and we need to just, just acknowledge how wonderful Jesus is. It's all about Jesus. It's all about his kingdom. It's all about his will. But on the third day, they came to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Galilee usually means that there's going to be a revelation. On the third day, the day of resurrection power, the day of transformation. On the third day when Abraham offered up Isaac. On the third day when King Hezekiah got an extension to his lifespan. On the third day when there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Something happened that released the power of God. This is the third day. For a day is as a thousand years. Just turn to Hosea chapter 6. Hold your finger in John because we're coming back. But Hosea chapter 6. Verse 1, it's a call to repentance, but really we're not going to move into the fear of God unless we allow him to do in us what he wants to do. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. Hosea 6.2, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight, in his presence. There is coming, I believe, an opportunity. We've always, like he he said, my presence will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But different people live in different depths of relationship with the Lord, don't they? You know, there are some people you just spend time and you think, wow, I just love what they bring. I love I love the presence of God that just emanates out of them. I love that. And there are other people that are, you know, trying to find where they fit in God. But there's coming a time, you know, where in in 2018, where he's saying, you know, I'm raising you up and you're taking you. You've always been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But now, now is the time when you're actually going to live it. You are actually going to live from that place, not just accessing it when you felt you needed to or for a time of warfare or anything else. But there's coming a greater depth of intimacy and a greater depth of, of walking with the presence of God than you've walked in before because we're going to be walking in the fear of God and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and as we walk in that and the fear of God will fall on the people in our cities and in our towns and that's when revival will break out in Jesus name that's when they'll know that he is not a God to be mocked he is not a God to be ridiculed he's not a God where you can take his rainbow his covenant sign and use it for your own purposes he's not that kind of a God he is not a God that will put up with this he is a God of transparency he is a God of truth he is a God of grace he is a God of honor. He is a God of, of absolute um, covenant loyalty, but he is a God of, that will not tolerate injustice. Amen. He's a God that will not tolerate, you know, like I saw, I don't know where I saw it. No idea where I saw it, but they're talking about all these men now that are being named, you know, in the uh, abusing women uh-huh. thing. And they're calling it, you know, like, oh, it's an issue and these things are happening. Let me tell you what it is. And Franklin Graham also said it. It's a sin. 
right? It's a sin. It is a sin. But it's also a sin for women to allow themselves to be used in bikinis and stuff like that to sell things. You know, like it's, it's two sides of the coin here. And so, the, you know, and it's, the thing is, it's a sin. If we talk about I've got an issue to deal with, guess what? You're not going to repent of an issue. You're going to try and work your way through it. But if it's a sin that's in your life, then it needs to be repented of and you need to ask God to rip the root of it out of your life that you would come into righteousness, that you would be dead to sin but alive to God through Jesus Christ. We've got to start using our words a little bit more truthfully and stop sugarcoating things up so that it's more comfortable for us because it's not about comfort. It's about living as a witness for Jesus Christ. It's about expanding his kingdom. It's about releasing God's presence and God's power and discipling nations and while we conform to be relevant to the nation we lose our power we lose our wisdom and we compromise what God has given us and entrusted to us to bring into the nation am I making sense so I'm way off track but anyway Jesus came to this wedding in the corner of Galilee there is a wedding coming up who is ready to be part of that marriage supper of the lamb are we squeaky clean are we you know white are we what is it spotless and without blemish that's the power of the holy spirit at work in us that's nothing we can do but are you ready for that have you fulfilled what god has written in your book for you to do before that happens that's something else that we've got to allow the holy spirit to work in through us not in your own strength let me get that straight you do it in your own strength it's going to blow up in your face it's not going to work it's got to be by the power and the revelation of the holy spirit but there is a wedding that's coming the marriage supper of the lamb and he said we've got to get yourself ready so what happened in this wedding was that they ran out of wine now in those days weddings were like went for seven days they usually started on a tuesday so that people could get through the sabbath and all of that and then travel to get there but usually a wedding went for about a week and so and everybody was invited and it sounds like, an, sounds like an Italian wedding. Oh my gosh. And everyone was invited. And it was, it was really an insult if you chose not to go. Right? So they had to plan. We've got X number of people coming. We've got to make sure that we've got enough food and we've got enough wine and, and we've got everything that we need. And so we've got this planning, logistical kind of thing happening. What happened was they ran out of wine which was a big embarrassment to the bridegroom, huge embarrassment. He actually kind of broke cultural hospitality laws at that time. And the other thing was that it also put him in a legal situation because the bride's family might feel so embarrassed and ashamed of who their bride was marrying that they could actually sue him. There could be legal implications if they ran out of wine legal implications from the bride's family and so all of this is happening now we don't know exactly who the wedding was with but jesus the disciples and mary were there so it was very much a divine thing then another thing in bible college we had to write an assignment on the social life of jesus christ because they didn't want everybody sort of sucked into ministry and ministry and just all there was so we actually had to do an assignment on the social life of Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, that tipped my head because I didn't really think he had one, right? But he did. And so we have to learn that there is a way of, of following the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will take us through the ministry side, the business side, doing what the Father wants. But then there's also that joyful celebration of being with people you love and celebrating what's going on in their lives or being with them and crying with them when something happens that's wrong. There's this interweaving of the Holy Spirit that brings about all of this into the fullness of the Father's will. How awesome is our God? And so we've got this dilemma. And Mary says to him, they've run out of wine. And he sort of gives this, what I thought was a pretty rude response. Or what's that got to do with you, with me, woman? You know, like, but actually, if he did something about it, it wouldn't affect Mary that much. But if he did do something about it, it would bring his ministry out into public light. He could no longer um, hide under the radar as it was. He would now be exposed. 
And so um, he was sort of saying, well, you know, there's a couple of ways of looking at this, but she knew the heart of God in her son. She knew the heart of the father was a heart of blessing and a heart of love. And so she just heard what Jesus said, but it didn't allow her to quench her faith, to stop her from believing, to call things up or anything like that. She turned to the servants and she said, whatever he says, do it. Let me tell you, that's a radical obedience. And if you want to move in the fullness of what God's got in 2018, we have to step into radical obedience, radical humility, radical forgiveness and radical um, generosity. And so she said, whatever he says, doesn't matter how unreasonable it seems, doesn't matter what he asks you to do, it doesn't matter if it seems so far out there that you're scared of doing, doesn't matter what he says, do it, do it, do it. So when you went home last week and you, you had your, you know, the, the, the altar, the sacrifice and you laid it on the altar, did you wait for God to speak to you? Did he tell you what to do? And have you done it? Whatever he said doesn't have to make sense. Let me tell you, God quite often does not make sense. Give me 10% and your 90% will go further than if you had the 100. Continue to give. And it'll be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, people pour it into your life. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to forgive your enemies when they're out to destroy you. It doesn't make sense to live humbly at the master's feet. It doesn't make sense in the earthly realm. But Mary is saying here, whatever he says to you, do it. You know, a relative of mine who was a um, Christian, uh, Christian, Catholic, um, wasn't too sure about me and my born again stuff that I'd gotten into. And, uh, you know, like I turned away from the church, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, he was very concerned. And he spoke to my mother, who, praised God, by then had no, was no longer an atheist and had come to Christ. And he had a word to my mother and she said, the Bible says, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. And he said in John chapter 3, you must be born again. Do it. So he got born again. <laughs> Just like that, because it brought it back to the power. It's in the word of God. It's in the word. The word is the power. The word is your salvation because the word is Jesus. So whatever he says to you, do it. Let's be radical. I am so tired of nice. I am so tired of placid, mundane, mediocre, just, you know, getting through life business as usual. That's not life with Jesus. You know, life with Jesus is exciting. It's, it's, it's adventurous. It's wonderful. There's wisdom. There's revelation. There's angels involved. doesn't matter what you enter into. God says, it's okay. I've got you back and I've got this to show you what to do. And we'll have some fun. You know, it's like when Graham Cook talks about Moses and he was taking the Egyptians out of, taking the Egyptians out of Egypt, taking Israel out of Egypt. And he said to Moses, do you want to have some fun? And Moses said, yeah, I'm all up for some fun. And he said, well, you go around to the front of Pharaoh's throne and you say, um, let my people go. And God said, and I'll nip around the back of Pharaoh's throne and I'll whisper in his ear, don't do it. Don't do it. We've got to have some fun. You know, we walk into situations and circumstances and we treat it like it's the end of the world, that it's the worst thing that could ever happen. But the word of God says that all things work together for your good because you're called according to his purpose and you love him. We walk into situations and circumstances and we feel weighed down and we can't see a way out and we're not sure what's going to happen. But oh my goodness me, God is the answer. Jesus Christ provides everything we need. He is the way out. He is our provision. He is our source. He is our everything. You know, why, why, why are we as weighed down and as, and as, as the world? Why? Why are we as worried about stuff as the world? Whether it's health or relationships or family or, you know, why are we looking at it from a world's perspective when we've got Jesus Christ and the word of God? Read the end of the book, The Devil Loses. In fact, he has lost. You know, we've got to start living light. Light. Let me read Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. For those of you who are struggling financially, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. This is taking it back to the original meaning. I just love Jesus. 
<gasps> Proverbs 3 verse 9. Honour the Lord with your possessions. Honour the Lord with your stuff. Doesn't matter whether it's your car, your dinner plates, your money. Honour him with what you've got. And with the first fruits of all your increase. So God expects you to increase. Now, we need to have the wisdom of God to handle it. If you're going to be stupid with your money, that's another issue. But if you've got the wisdom of God and you are a good manager, and if you're not a good manager, ask him to make you one. But it says in verse 10, your barns will be filled with plenty. God will draw wealth to your storehouses and God will flow wealth into your storehouse in a steady stream and your storehouse will be replenished, restocked and restored. And it will be filled with plenty. It will be filled with an abundance, riches, luxury, affluence and running over with an inexhaustible supply. That's what the Hebrew word means for plenty, sabah. And then he says, and your vats will overflow with new wine. And didn't they say in the wedding that, hey, we're out of wine. And when they came to Jesus, he gave them new wine. And it says that your vats will overflow with new wine. That means that you will be super productive, that there will be a supernatural element of achievement in everything that you do, that God will work with you, that he'll establish the work of your hands. Dear God, we should be just the most excited people on earth when we see what God has done for us. But I tell you, some of us are like that wedding in Cana of Galilee where we have run out of stuff they ran out of wine we can run out of hope we can run out of vision we can run out of dreams we can run out of um, forgiveness if somebody's done us wrong we just want to do something back we can run out of forgiveness we, we can run out of the anointing of the Holy Spirit we can run out of stuff. So I want you to think about your life right now. Where is it that you feel that life is a little bit mediocre, that it's a bit mundane, that there's no real passion and life and flow of Jesus flowing through what you've got? What have you run out of in your life? What have you run out of? Because these six stone water pots that they, that they had, you know, were going to fill with water, that represents people. Six is the number of, of man um, because man was made on the six days. So there's six stone water pots and it talks in the Old Testament that people had hearts of stone. Moses wrote the law on tablets of stone. So we have here stone, right? Stone pots. It was used for purification of cleansing. They used to wash before they ate. And if you've got a week-long feast happening, there's a lot of washing before you eat. But they were, And he said, I want you to fill these pots with water and they fill them to the brim but what have you run out of when they said here we've run out of wine what have you run out of have you run out of a sensing of the anointing on your life have you run out of a sense of peace what is it that you feel that life is no longer has for you because God does not want you to live like that. God wants to make you like those stone water pots and he wants to fill you with the effervescing flow of the Holy Ghost. He wants to get you drunk in a new wine. He wants to move things around in your life so that it's a joy and it's a thrill and things are exciting and you're starting to get a vision for the future and you're starting to see things. Am I the only one getting excited here? Because man, I'm getting excited, guys. This is awesome. So what have you run out of? One of the things that we don't, when we don't walk in what God's got for us, us is because we're not honest with God we think it's 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 dishonoring to say hey God you know what I think my life really stinks right now I'm a little bit tired of financial stress I'm, I'm over my family whatever it might be and we don't want to be honest with God because well it's not faith you know you've got to speak the word and doubt. he wants you honest he can deal with honesty. He can deal with what's in your heart. He can deal with your confusion. One of my sons, absolutely, I can tell how much of a spirit of religion I had, but one of my sons, we'd been born again a short time and we were struggling and we didn't have enough money to do something he needed to do and there wasn't enough food and, you know, the typical story, single mum, six kids. It was, it was a hard time. And he came in the house and he screamed at God and he said, what kind of a God are you that you can't even look after us? And I'm going, oh my God, thunder and lightning, you know, like he's going to be like zapped on the spot. But, he, but then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, I love his honesty because I can deal with that. But I can't deal with the religion in your life, Suzette, because you are not even listening to the truth. So I was so grateful. I'm still nervous. <laughs> still nervous. <laughs> 
but you know but we've got to be honest with God okay God how how come that the business ventures that I've stepped into haven't worked out God how come that the doors of opportunity haven't opened I have run out of opportunity God I've run out of hope God I'm being honest with you I am a stone vessel I feel like I'm, I'm turning to stone things are solidifying around me and there is no way out and there's no way through and I don't know where to turn and I don't know what to do but God I'm come to Jesus Christ because I need the new wine We've got to be honest, guys. We can't hide anymore. You can't hide behind your situation, your circumstance. He knows what you're thinking. He can deal with whatever it is that you're going to say to him. He's bigger than whatever it is that you're facing. His promises are sure, but we have to face what is holding us back in order to break through. Does that make sense? And I don't want it to make sense. I want it to be a revelation. He's wonderful. But he wants to hear from you what you have run out of. What have you run out of? Tell him. Write it down. Go home and pray about it. God, I've run out of hope for the future. Nothing has changed for years. I never thought, my father says constantly, I never thought I'd end up like this. And I'm sitting there with him and I'm thinking, I didn't think I would either. <laughs> And then I said, God, I repent, I want to repent. But you know what? My father has run out of a vision for the future. He's run out of hope that anything could ever change for him. He's run out of hope that things would ever get better. That's where he's at. But instead of going to Jesus, he's holding on to the emptiness, to the, the stone part of his heart. You know, in Mark chapter 4, where it talks about sowing the word, it was the, the, the hard place where you know, the birds came and ate it. But then the stony place was when it came and it grew a little bit and then it just shriveled up because there was no depth of root. How many of us have started in something that we thought was, oh, yes, this is God, this is awesome, this is amazing. And then two or three months later, it's just fizzled up and it's gone. And we're sort of like, well, what happened? I was so sure that was God. The body of Christ has run out of some stuff. And Jesus is saying, there's a wedding coming. There's a wedding coming. I want to make sure that you have the best, the absolute best. We've run out of man's plans and man's programs. Hey, it doesn't work, doesn't grow the church, doesn't change communities, doesn't bring transformation. We've run out of mental assent. We can agree with the word mentally, but again, that doesn't bring life and that doesn't give change. It just means I agree with it, but I can be talked out of it because it's not a revelation of the spirit, it's in the intellect of the mind. We can run out of a lot of things. We can just assume that because we're anointed by God and the Holy Ghost, we're just anointed and this is what, you know, this, I'm anointed, I can do this. Doesn't mean that the anointing is not going to change. Doesn't mean that it's not always going to be up and down. You have, to, you have to press in for the anointing because people can come and steal your anointing. You know, frustration can steal your anointing and affect it and, and cause it to drain out of your life. So we've got to start being honest. And I'll tell you, next week will be a much nicer sermon. But, <laughs> but we, need to, we need to position ourselves. What have you run out of? And for some of us, it might be time. You know what? So busy. Not run out of time as in going home, but just busy. Busy with work, busy with the family, busy. And in the busyness, we've lost the pace of grace, the rhythm of heaven. So what have you run out of? What is it that is affecting you? What is it that when you get up in the morning, you say things like, oh God, instead of, oh God, how awesome, another day with you. What is it that makes you, when you look at your bank statement, go, oh, I hope I can meet this bill. What is it? What is it in you? What is it that has run out? Because Jesus is wanting to bring a replenishment, a restocking and a restoring, but of the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing of your flesh. Does that make sense? 
And then with that comes the radical part, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says. Sometimes, you know, my, the Lord's told me to do stuff. And I made the mistake of telling my dad. And he could find a thousand and one very good reasons why it was not a good idea to do it. All of it came from the fact that he loved me, but he didn't want me to get hurt, which meant as long as I lived in a bubble and didn't step out of the comfort zone, as long as everything was safe and da da da, which is lovely, it was his father's heart, but it's not the father's heart. And so I've learnt not to tell my father anything until after I've done it and then go, hey, Dad, look what I've done. Isn't this awesome? And then he's got to agree to it. You know, but so we've, we've honestly got to come to a place. Don't, don't you want to wake up in the morning and be absolutely exhilarated with love for Jesus and what he wants you to do? Don't you want to wake up in the morning and, and just cast every burden onto him and live with such carefree vigor and vim that life takes on a whole new meaning? Don't you want a fresh new infilling of the Holy Ghost that you can get right royally, divinely drunk? Yeah. yeah, you need to get drunk. Some of you need to get seriously Holy Spirit drunk. Be filled with new wine, just like these stone water pots. Be filled with new wine. Be filled with new wine. The stone water pots needed to, to, to carry a new, something they'd never carried before. Because the, the um, what do you call it, the guy that ran the wedding, he said most people bring out the worst wine no, what is it? They bring out the best and then when as people get a bit drunk and whatever, they bring out the worst. But you, you've left the best to last. So don't you want to be filled with the best? The best of what God's got for you? To be filled with the best of the wine? To be filled with the best? And this is where we've got to lay down what we think, how we, how we, um, how we see things, our perspective. It's always got to come back to what does our Lord Jesus Christ, the living word of God, say? In the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 18 it says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, the new wine the new wine. So whatever he tells you to do it, do it. See, Moses with the law turned water into blood, but Jesus with grace turned water into wine. The best, the best. And we're all a little bit over mundane, mediocre. I want there to be such a sharp division of redemption between my life and the people in the world that it can be seen by the people in the world. I want them to see the hand of God that protects me, that's on my family, that's on our finances, our income, on everything we do. I want that. You know, I'm, I'm pressing in for that. And for those of you who've read the, the newsletter today, I am going to finish up with this story of Alexander Kerr because he knew when the things were empty how to get new wine. That he was 14 years of age back in around about 18, late 1890s or 1890s, 14 years of age. And he, um, he heard D.L. Moody preach. And at 14 years of age, he gave his life to the Lord. And then he, somebody gave him a little booklet about tithing. And, um, and he thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put God to the test and I'm going to start now. So he started right where he was with what he had. And he tithed and he offered and he saved. And, in a, and he got a job working in a glass manufacturing company. But then over a period of some years, he had saved enough to buy a company, to start his own business. So he started the Alexander Kerr Manufacturing Company. And in 1906, when the earthquake happened in San Francisco, he was over in the east of the US. And the earthquake struck. And he got a telegram from a friend that said, there's been a huge earthquake. I can't see, can't get to your um, factory, but I would say that it's, it's demolished. You're probably ruined. So he wrote back um, something along the lines of, uh, disaster cannot outweigh the promise of God. God rebukes the devourer for my sake. That was what he stood on. God rebukes the devourer for my sake. 
Two days later, we got another telegram. There's been a huge fire raging through um, San Francisco. It's all around where your factory is. You're a ruined man. He wrote back, God rebukes the devourer for my sake. A couple of days later, and you can Google this, a couple of days later, he um, gets another telegram and it says, For a mile and a half, all around your factory, everything is completely destroyed. There is nothing left standing. But your factory is untouched. He, his factory was made of wood. It had propane tanks in there full of gas, which he used for making of the glass. It had gone through a, a what do you call it, earthquake. It had withstood the fire. The only thing that was burnt was one part of a fence but nothing on his property was touched. Not one glass jar was smashed or cracked or, or even cracked. He was completely untouched because God rebukes the devourer for, for his sake. And so he stood on the word of God because this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And Mary was a woman of faith. And she said to, to the servant, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And so I want to ask you to step into a place of radical faith today, that you'll step into that place where you hear the voice of the good shepherd and the voice of a stranger you will not follow. And you will hear his instructions. And no matter how weird it seems, no matter how far out of the comfort box it is, that you'll say, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever it is you tell me to do because that will change the ordinary in you into the super ordinary of God. That will bring a fresh anointing. That will release the new wine of the Holy Ghost. That will change things for you. As obedience releases so much, but it's an obedience that comes from love, not because you have to do it. It's an obedience of loving God because I love you, God. I'm happy to do. Well, I might not be happy, Lord. I'm a bit worried about this, but... I'm going to step out and I'm going to do it because God wants to fill you with fresh wine. God wants to fill you with fresh wine. He does not want you to live ordinary lives, mediocre lives, mundane lives. He does not want you to be like the people in the world. He wants the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the power of his word to elevate you to a place where you are living as one who is living from his kingdom so that your very life reflects the glory of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 2 verse 11 it says that because of this sign, the disciples believed on Jesus. In John chapter 20, and this is the full circle in the book of John. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says, And Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This word witnesses to the name and the power and the life of Jesus Christ. And the book of John is holy for written for the church so that we would believe and, and, and receive the life of Jesus Christ. But more than that, he wants you to receive a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. Those areas where you're empty, those areas where you're dry, those areas where you feel that your heart or your conscience is as hard as stone. He wants to change that. He wants to move in with the fire of God. He wants to bring healing and wholeness. And he wants to bring in the fullness of the wine of the Holy Ghost. That you'd no longer be in your own control, but you'd be under the influence of the Holy Ghost, the influence of wine. You know what an alcoholic does? They can't wait for the next drink. They've got stuff hidden everywhere so that they can just have the next drink. I just want the next drink. They, they just want more. And we've got to be like that with the Holy Spirit. We just want more. I just want more. I just want more. I want to be under his control, not my control. You know, because an alcoholic or a drunk, they're not under their own control. There's happy drunks. There's angry drunks. There's, you know, um, who? funny drunks. They all come under the control of the Spirit. But we want to come under the control of the Holy Spirit and yield up our own control because it, it's nothing and just flow in the Holy Ghost and allow Him to do what He wants to do because there's a wedding coming and God wants His bride ready and He wants us being filled with the Holy Ghost to move in everything He's called us to do. And there are people out there. I mean, praise God, we've got a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can come to Jesus and we say, fill us up, Lord. I just 
just want a fresh infilling. It was after the second infilling of the Acts of the disciples in the book of Acts, the second infilling that they had. That's when the miracles just, just broke out all over the place. But you know, there are people out there that have never yet turned to Jesus Christ. There are people out there that don't know that he's wonderful, that he can save, that he can heal, he can set their kids free of drugs. He can, he can put food on the table. He can provide them with work. They don't know about the power of an almighty God. But as we walk in it, as we allow the wine of the Holy Spirit to flood in through us, to control us, to to just radiate through us and that life will change not just for us but for the people around us and that's what the father's heart is craving because God so loved the world he so loved the world that he sent his only son father we just want to thank you for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit tonight that we've received of the new wine that, Father, you get all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. And we thank you that no matter where we're at, your hand is on our lives. You lead us and you guide us and you fill us afresh and anew with the Holy Spirit and the fire of God. Oh, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing and we surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen.